say, Jesus, we love you. We want to thank you, my God, for how you have kept us from one week to the next. We want to thank you, my God, for the battles that you have fought on our behalf. We want to thank you, my God, that which was meant for bad, you have turned it around for good. You have turned every curse into a blessing. God, we want to take this time to say we are grateful to you, that we are grateful, my God. We don't take you for granted. We bless you today. We bless you today, my God. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but glory to God, we know who holds tomorrow. And we bless you today. We honor you and we exalt you. We lift you up and glorify you. My God, some of us may have had a tough week this week, but God, you brought us through. And I thank you for that. I thank you for that. My God. Many may have thought, they, didn't even, they may not even be here today. Body was racked with pain. Troubles going on around them all on both sides. But Lord, you brought us through. And for that, I say thank you. I give you the glory and the honor. It's only you, Jesus. It is in you that we live, move, and have our being. It is because of you, Jesus, that the blood is yet running warm through our veins. It is because of you, Jesus, that we have breath in our lungs. It is because of you that we are in our right mind. It is because of you that we have the activity of our limbs. Nothing that we could have ever done, my God. Nothing that we could buy, my God. Nothing that we could ever do could do what you have done for us. My God, we thank you. We thank you. Glory be to God. And more importantly, God, you know who we are. You know our name. My God, you know us, and we thank you. My God, thank you for your blood covering. Thank you, Jesus. We take nothing for granted. Just the fact that when we opened our eyes, the sky was not our roof. That you kept our homes, our apartments, my God, wherever we dwell intact. No fire destroyed our dwelling, and for that I say thank you, my God. No stray bullets hit us. You kept our children, our grandchildren. Everything that we have committed unto you, you have kept. And even those things that we have forgotten to commit, you kept. Lord, we just give you the praise and the glory and the honor. We want to thank you, my God, because you are marvelous. You are wonderful. You're glorious. You're outstanding in all of your ways. You are immortal. You are invisible. You are the only wise God. And all dominion and all power and all glory belongs to you. There is no God like Jesus. You are the only wise God. Your Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last, the author and finisher of our faith. You are the wheel in the middle of the wheel. You are the one that floats my boat. Glory to God, and I bless you. And I thank you this morning. I thank you for this brand new day that you have allowed us to see. You have allowed us to behold the beauty of your handiwork. My God. I thank you for that. Oh, it is a blessing to be alive one more day. Glory be to God. Many have laid down last night, but today they are on a cooling board or in the hospital, incapacitated. But God, you have graced us one more day. And for that, I say thank you. I say thank you. My God, when we realize and we recognize that our problems are not as big as our God, my God, we thank you for that, Jesus. We thank you. And God bless each and every one of you. God bless you. It's good to see you once again. It is really good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Oh, yes, it is. Glory be to God. It is. It's a blessing. It's a blessing that God has opened the door for us, that he has allowed us to have service like this. Where many houses of the Lord are close, still closed and been closed since last March. But God in his mercy has kept us, kept our doors. And for that, we say thank you. Oh my God, I say thank you. We have not lacked nothing. The lights are still on, the heat works, glory be to God. The protection is all around this building. My God, for these things, we say thank you. We say thank you. Take nothing for granted. But the Lord has spoken again this week, and he, glory to God, there's something that's troubling him, it's troubling him. 
you know, sometimes we take things for granted. We kind of hold on to stuff. That because we don't want nobody to know. <coughs> that we are ashamed of. And because we are ashamed, we miss our blessing and we hinder ourselves. And we can't obtain the blessings that the Lord has because of a box marked X in our spirit. Just want to talk to you for a moment about the thing that's on the Lord's heart today that he poured into my spirit to give to you. So we want to turn to Psalms 32, verses 3 and 4, and 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. That's Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4, and then go to 2 Corinthians, New Testament, chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. Father God, we thank you this morning. We bless your name. We want to thank you, my God, that your word shall go forth and it will accomplish that which you please. We thank you in advance, my God, for tearing down every stronghold, removing every stumbling block, every hindrance that would try to smother this word from reaching your people. We bind it, muzzle it, and cancel the assignment now in the name of Jesus. We want to thank you and praise you, my God, that you love us, that you love us so much, that you have sent us a word today, my God, to encourage, to strengthen, to make us aware, to reveal in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, have your way in and through me. Speak through me today. Speak through me, teacher. My God, let the words go forth and land on good ground. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalms 32, verses 3 and 4, and then 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. When I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roaring all day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into drought of summer, Selah. Think about it. Dwell on this. Let it meditate. Let it marinate. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of God. Of Christ. Just want to talk to you for a moment about pulling down your stronghold. Pulling down your stronghold. And you do have a, some of you have a stronghold. Oh, yeah. Lord spoke. You may be seated. He spoke, spoke quite clearly. A stronghold is a place that has been fortified as to protect it against an attack or a place where a particular cause or belief is strongly defended or upheld. That's a stronghold. We know that when Joshua came against the walls of Jericho, he had to walk around seven times, my God, because it was fortified, amen? Naturally, it could not be torn down. It had to be torn down spiritually. And that's what happened with the walls of Jericho. But the Lord let me know something here today. Glory be to God. The stronghold that we're going to talk about today is the forgiveness of self. <laughs> the forgiveness of self. Forgiveness of self. What are you talking about? Because you have neglected to forgive yourself because you have betrayed your best friend when you was in the world. You your friend had betrayed, given you trust, put things into your trust, even put their mate into your trust that you would be around them and not to do anything funny, but you betrayed your best friend and lost your best friend. My God, betrayal. The things that you have did that were so dastardly and devilish that you don't even want nobody to know about, you have put it in a place in your spirit that you don't want nobody to know, but it's holding you back. The things that you have done, my God, that people would look at you, you think, and look down upon you because they say you could do something like that. So you neglect to talk about it. You don't even want to think about it, the things that you have done. How you took money from your mother when she wasn't even aware of it. My God. You felt ashamed the way you treated your mother. Matter of fact, you're still holding some people that have already died. 
and you neglected to say you were sorry while they was alive. You have betrayed them while they was alive. You hurt their feelings. You hurt them. You hurt family. But my God, now you're holding on to it because you don't want nobody to know. You have not forgiven yourself. My God, betrayal, betrayal, betrayal. Every time you hear a certain person's name, my God, it ignites something into you. Matter of fact, it's so rough. God is trying to get a, his word across to you that, my God, this thing comes back to you while you're watching TV, while you're just walking down the street. Your mind is on something else. But the thing that you did that was so dastardly, that was so that you portrayed somebody so harshly, it comes back and God's trying to tell you to, to repent of it, that I've already forgiven you, but you don't want to deal with it. Hmm. Forgiving of self. Oh, we are aware what Jesus says in the New Testament in the book of Matthew chapter 6 of the Lord's Prayer. You read the Lord's Prayer. It tells you that after the Lord's Prayer says, if you don't forgive man on earth, the Heavenly Father won't forgive you. We know that. And so therefore, we are ready to forgive people sometimes. And I say sometimes. Because even with that, you hold back from for, for truly forgiving people. Because you remember what they did to you and it's hard for you to forgive them. But do you realize that forgiveness is not for people? Forgiveness is for you. Forgiveness is for you. And it's, we are so readily, again, to forgive other people, but we neglect to forgive ourselves. To forgive ourselves. We cause ourselves to feel sorry for our condition. Because, you know, if I didn't put this into my, into my body when I was younger, I would not have the problems that I have right now. Not forgiving yourself. Because that's ignorance, amen? And so God forgives us for ignorance. For forgiving yourself, and I'm going to give you a word, and I'm going to show you what God wants us to know. But this is what he is telling me to tell you today. You here, there's some here, and some are going to be viewing later on, that have not forgiven their self for the things that they have done. How they have hurt other people. How they hurt other people. How they hurt themselves. How they betrayed loved ones. How the, the, once, the once close friend that you had, again, that trusted you with their precious possessions, you betrayed and lost a friendship that you long for today, but you can't get it because you betrayed. And so, therefore, you're just not forgiving yourself. Hmm. I feel the Holy Spirit right now, so I'll go over. I could stop preaching right now. Right now. It's already starting to convict in here. Already. Mm. Forgiving self. And it has a lot to do, again, with coming back to it. How you were trusted. And you betrayed a trust. Sometimes we talk about how somebody betrayed you, but you betrayed. You hurt people that really loved you and trusted you. You hurt them, and now they're going on. And it's just eating, at, eating, eating up at you, but you don't want to even think about it no more because every time the memory comes back, my God, Visually, you can see what's going on. You can actually see it, even though it happened years ago. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, the apostle Paul tells us, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Hmm. He also lets us know in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Hmm. But if you continue to condemn yourself after receiving the grace and the forgiveness of Christ, isn't there a sense in which you are denying the faith and crucifying the Son of God all over again? Hmm? If you have not forgiven yourself, aren't you truly denying yourself? You're denying the faith, and you're actually, as Hebrews 6 and 6 says, 
you're crucifying Jesus all over again. Because you don't take that forgiveness as replying to your situation. You think it only applies when you forgive somebody else. But what about you? What about you? Don't you think when Jesus said it is finished and I forgive, he was talking about you too? Not just the sins that you, my God, he, he, he forgave you for, your, your drunkenness and your whoring around and doing whatever you did, but he wants you to forgive you. I know if you had the, the opportunity to go back in time, you probably would not have done what you did. If you had the opportunity, you would not have done to your body what you have done to your body. And now today in 2021, your body is, is still telling on you for what you did 20 years ago. But you can't change nothing. But you can forgive yourself. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Trying to have other people feeling sorry for you. When people are walking up to you and telling you. You need to forgive yourself. God uses them to tell you to forgive yourself and you don't want to hear because you say, you don't know what I did. You don't know what I did. All you see is now, but you don't know how I used to be. Mm -mm, you don't know. You don't know what I did in the dark and, huh, and it came out in the light. Oh, you don't know. But I'll tell you who does know. Jesus Christ. So he sends a word to this house and to those that's going to view it later on that you need to forgive yourself because more actually you are denying the faith. You are denying the faith. You are denying the work that our Savior has done on Golgotha, Calvary. You are denying it. And you are crucifying Jesus Christ afresh. As Hebrews 6 and 6 says. Mm. So the Lord kept speaking. Because he has forgiven your sins. Micah 7, 19 says this. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Hmm. He says, he will turn to us. He will turn to us and forgive us. And then take that sin, because if you don't forgive yourself, that's a sin. That is a sin. You do not have a clean spirit. It's sin. And he will cast it into the depths of the sea. I know some saints say he will cast it in the sea of forgetfulness, which is the same thing. Well, that's what it's saying. But what it is also saying, why do you have to remind God of what you did to somebody when God already forgave you for it? Why are you walking around neglecting to forgive yourself when God has already forgiven you for it? Why are you denying the faith and crucifying Jesus Christ afresh because you refuse because you think what you did in the past is so dastardly sinful that Jesus could never forgive you for it? Every drop of blood that he shed on Calvary was for you and I. And when he said it is finished, it is finished. But you can't forgive yourself. You can't forgive yourself. Because it was so terrible. My God, it cost me to lose my closest friends, my family members. Because what I did, they trusted me. They trusted me. And I turned on them. Isaiah 43 and 25 says, I... Even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake and will not remember thy sins. He does it for himself, amen, that he can bless you. And you turn around and say, actually what you're saying, Lord, I don't want your blessings. I don't deserve your blessings because I am a terrible person. So I'd rather walk around and shortchange my blessings because I feel that Jesus Christ cannot forgive me because what I did was so messed up. I've been carrying this thing for years. 
And as I get in the scripture, you're going to see the cause of what happens when you carry stuff for years. What happens to you? Some of the sicknesses that God's children are walking around with right now, it's not because they didn't forgive somebody else. It's because they didn't forgive themselves. Many Christians cannot receive the true blessings of the Lord Jesus because they don't feel they're worthy because of what they did in the past. Let that marinate, see law for a minute. Just for a minute. Because it's in the house. <laughs> it is. Otherwise, the Lord wouldn't have sent this message. He wouldn't have sent it. Some of his children. I don't care how anointed you are. Because all, God gives gifts without repentance. Okay? So no matter how anointed you are, it doesn't matter how many tongues you can speak in. If you have not forgiven yourself, you are denying the faith and crucifying our Lord and Savior over again. There's nothing that you or I could have ever done that our Savior would not forgive us. Nothing. I don't care what you used to be. I look at you now and you look at me now. And that does not really tell what we were. We see us as we are now. Amen? But if the Lord Jesus would ever, in his wisdom and in his power, take these monitors and let them go back 25 years and put your face up there, what would it look like? Hmm? What would it look like? Where would you be? Would you be in somebody's bed that you shouldn't be in? Huh? Would you be looking around in the supermarket or the, uh, the department stores when nobody's looking and you stealing? Now that just came out of my mouth, so therefore it had to be your list. Some of you must have been some good shoplifters in here. One thing that I have found about children of God, many times they can be hypocritical. They can be phony. You know what you used to do. But you have been forgiven. Amen? You're not that anymore. I hope you're not. You're not there anymore. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things are passed away. Behold! All things have become new. What you used to do in the past is for a testimony. Because there's no testimony without the death of a testator. So you had to go what you go, which, what you went through. But if in fact Jesus Christ has taken you out of it and brought you through it, it's for your testimony and for his glory. I don't care what you have done. Some children of God are ashamed because, my God, They have participated with man on man, woman on woman. I'll put it like that. You did it. And you're so ashamed of that, you ain't telling nobody. But you need to repent of it. God has forgiven you. But you're so ashamed. You think it's so messed up dastardly. I'm trying to say things as nicely as I can. The way I hear it in my spirit. Because at that time, that's what you did. Maybe you did it because you were so broken hearted because of a, of a relationship. You went the other direction. Or maybe it was because you were so filled up with alcohol and drugs, you didn't know what you was doing until the next morning. Whatever the case might be, may, may have been, glory be to God, when you did it, then it made you feel bad afterwards. But once you came to Christ and Christ has forgiven you, once you submitted your life to Christ Jesus, whatever you did in the past has been forgiven. It should no longer be a stronghold in your life. 
It should no longer be a place that you have built as a defense that you don't want nobody to penetrate. Oh, but I'm here today to tell somebody I'm coming against your stronghold. I'm coming. Through the Holy Spirit, I'm coming against your stronghold. I'm telling you that God knows. And he's going to use this oracle to come against your stronghold. I'm going to come against your Jericho. You thought it was impenetrable. Impenetrable. You thought that it was a big wall around it. Could nobody get in? Can nobody fort- get into it because you got it fortified? Well, I hear under the unction of the Holy Spirit, I am coming against your stronghold. I am going to speak it in the air. Yes, that's right. You participated in the wicked stuff. Oh, yes, you did. You was using incantations. You went to the psychics. My God, you sent money to them so they could tell you, my God, your future from a lying demon. You even had a spiritual guide. Oh, yes, you did. You thought your spiritual, spiritual guy could do it all. But Jesus, <laughs> but Jesus, comes to tear down your strongholds. Come on, I'll let you know. That spiritual guy wanted to kill you, not bless you. Mm-hmm. Oh, I ain't talking. I'm talking to somebody that's going to view this later on, right? Oh, yeah. Some of you in here right now, glory be to God, had even had the audacity, the immitigated gall to tell Satan, if you just bless me, I'll serve you. In your ignorance, you said it. I'm coming against your stronghold. God again can call you by name and put you on blast, but I'm going to put it in the atmosphere. And you've been walking around, and you wonder why your body's racked with pain. Hmm. Glory be to God. In the text, David starts out. This text, this text originates in 2 Samuel chapter 12 with the Samuel, with um, Nathan coming to David about the actions which he committed with Bathsheba and Uriah. This is what this is talking about. For those of you that don't know, remember that it was a time to go to war, and David decided to stay home. And when you, when the Lord speaks to you, and you know that it's time to go to church, or it's time to get in prayer, it's time to dedicate yourself to the things of the, of the kingdom, but you decide you ain't going to do it, you have now said, come on in, Satan, mess with me. You've opened the door. And this was David. It says because he didn't go to war, he went on top of the roof. And we went on the roof. He looked over, happened to look over the wall. He didn't happen to look. He was directed by that spirit of lust. He looked over the wall, and he saw this fine woman cleansing herself after her ministerial time, her period. She was bathing herself, and he looked. And it does not say that he covered his eyes. It does not say that he turned his back. But it did say he went to his service and said, bring that woman to me. And we know the story. He went into Bathsheba. Bathsheba was going to conceive. But Bathsheba was married. Was married. And there's some in here right now that mess around with married people. And you didn't forgive yourself. You knew they was married. You knew it. But you didn't care. Because the lust of your flesh said, I'm going to do it. But because of that action, my God, you lost friends. I'm coming against the stronghold. I'm telling you, I hear the Holy Spirit. He's not pointing you out, but he's here. And because that you have not forgiven yourself. 
So it says that David tried two times to get Uriah to go home drunk and sleep with his wife because then he'd wake up and think that the child was his. Because when soberness conceals, drunkenness reveals. <laughs> it's true. If you really want, well, you can't do it now, but if you really want to know something about somebody, get them drunk. I used to bowl with a lot of white boys down south. Right? I travel lead bowling on a, white, a team with four white guys. They was all my friends. I played softball with them, on this team with them. When they were sober, they never made any kind of racial remarks. But once they got that fire water in them, then they started making little sly remarks, saying little things. You know, what soberness conceals, drunkenness reveals. And what the adversary does, he want, the Lord wants to keep us sober, but the adversary tries to make you drunk with the things he could give you. So it kind of reveals to you and to other people who you really are. But we see David, he commanded Uriah to die, put him in the front of the battle. Now, they were told never to go into battle right next to the wall, where the women of the wall could take a big stone and throw it over the wall and kill him. David commanded Joab to put Uriah at the foot of the wall, at the foot of the wall. So when the women looked over the wall, they took a rock, whoop, and killed him, and killed him. And he made Joab tell him, after it was done, come and tell me that Uriah is dead. Then he put on a front when he was told this. What? He's dead? Who put him in the front? David did it. But this is what people do when they commit a sin. They try to cover it up. And it says in 2 Samuel 12, Nathan comes to Daniel and he gives him the parable. We know the parable about the ewe lamb. The rich man takes his ewe, one little lamb, and takes it and kills it. And David got mad and said, who is that man? And Nathan tells him, you're the man. But look what David says here now in the text in chapter 32. He says, blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. But then he says this, when I kept silent, number one, my bones whacked old, through my roaring all day long, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, and moisture is turned into the drought of summer. So David is talking about, again, 2 Samuel. He says his bones wax old. That's the misery because of sin, unconfessed sin. That's misery. The roaring all day long, unrest. When you are walking around, glory be to God, with unconfessed sin, when you are walking around with unforgiveness, you get no rest. It's misery. David says, thy hand was heavy upon me. He was under conviction from the Lord. Just like the Holy Spirit convicts us, amen? Trying to get us to repent. Under conviction. No rest. Misery. The moisture is turned into drought of summer. That's the burden of guilt. Sin carries a heavy burden. Sin carries a heavy burden. Glory, yes, it does. It does not make you want to enjoy anything because you're under conviction. You cannot enjoy anything because you're under conviction. And that is the reason why many children of God can't enjoy walking in salvation right now, because they're under conviction. Because of what they did years ago. They come down to the altar, and they ask for repent. They ask for help, for prayer, for everything else except the thing that they don't want to talk about. And they leave the altar with the same problem. Because they're trying to, my God, get cleansed from one thing and God has got his finger on something else. On something else. And it says, his hand was heavy upon me. That means the Holy Spirit is not going to let up. Mm-mm.
can't sleep at night because his hand is heavy upon me. My appetite is messed up because his hand is heavy upon me. My attitude is jacked up because his hand is heavy upon me. I forgot how to enjoy life because his hand is heavy upon me. Oh, I have my moments where I can laugh, but the majority of my life is full of conviction. So my face is all frowned up. And because my face is all frowned up, now here come the lines in my forehead, the lines around my mouth. My God, I just can't have, enjoy anything because I'm under conviction. And all you have to do is ask God, my God, and tell God, I repent for not believing you. I repent. Glory to God for keeping this stronghold in my life. This box that I got marked X. But again, look what David says. I want you to hear this because I'm coming against your strongholds in here. My bones wax old. That means you're bringing sickness on yourself. That's the misery. He says, my bones have waxed old. I'm only 25, but I look like I'm 53. Because I'm walking around with unconfessed stuff. I haven't forgiven myself. So my bones wax old. I'm inviting sickness to come. I'm inviting things to come into my life that Jesus Christ has already went to Calvary for. But because I have not forgiven myself, I am denying the faith. I'm putting him on the cross afresh and anew. Hebrews 6 and 6. It's roaring all day long. That means I don't have no rest. Even when I'm not thinking about it, it pops into my mind. I'm driving, it comes into my mind. I'm trying to enjoy a TV show, it pops into my mind. And Lord, help me when I say I want to go to sleep. Then these thoughts just bombard my mind. I ask God, I take authority over it in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood over my mind, but nothing seems to happen. His hand is heavy upon me. Did you ever wonder or wish that the Holy Spirit would just let up for a little bit? Tell the truth on yourself. You feel it in you. You feel it. You feel the Holy Spirit putting his hand on it. But you are refusing. You're saying, I rebuke you, Satan. And it ain't Satan. It's the Holy Spirit. Moisture has turned into the drought of summer, and that's the burden of guilt. The drought of summer means no water. You cannot enjoy nothing. The drought of summer. The moisture is gone. You're dried up. All because you have neglected to forgive yourself. This is David talking about the fact that he neglected to forgive himself. He says, when I kept silent. But you can keep silent all day long. <laughs> you can hear me? You can keep your mouth shut all day long. But I'm going to tell you something. You can't shut the mouth of the Lord. All things are open before him. Nothing is hidden. He knew you when you did it. He knew you before you did it. That's why he went to Calvary to make, you, make a way for you, that you can have access to the Father, that you can walk around with a clean spirit. But once again, there are some things that you think God can forgive you for, and there's some things that you think God will not forgive you for, because the thing that you did was so dastardly, so sinful, so terrible, that God could never, ever forgive me for that. And you are denying the faith and crucifying Jesus Christ all over again. You know, it's got to the point now where I can hear 
you're wondering how long I'm going to talk. I hear you. <laughs> That's why I know the Holy Spirit is working out here. You want me to shut up because I just might put you on blast, and I'm not going to do it. But I am going to tell you, you are hindering your own blessings because you are walking around with unconfessed sin. You're holding yourself for what you did for years ago. But I want to encourage you. If you're here now, and if you're going to be under the sound of my voice, you must know that God brought you through. You see, to God, sin is sin. I know people put categories of sin. If you were a murderer, that's one sin. If you were a rapist, that's another sin. If you were a whoremonger, that's another sin. If you were a liar, that's another sin. Because you got white lie, pink lie, blue lie. So it depends on what lie you tell. But in God, sin is sin. And the word says, if you don't want to hear it, put, put your thing in your ears like this here. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not is sin. So if you have not forgiven yourself, it's sin. I'll say it again. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not is sin. I'm not saying it. The word of the Lord says it. So we see David here. Say, when I kept silent, all these four things were happening to me. If you read the rest of Psalm 32, you see, after he confessed what God does, he makes him a hiding place, he watches out for him, he fights his battles, but that's only after, my God, he confessed. So now we come over to 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, talking about the stronghold that Paul talks about. Because that was David's stronghold, the unconfessed sin. That was he figured nobody would ever know. Isn't that something? Now, David was a man of God. He was a man after God's own heart. But he figured, I'm going to keep silent. Nobody's going to know what I'm doing. I'm still going to come to church. I'm still going to raise my hands. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to come in here and Because nobody going to know my stronghold. I'm still going to serve on certain auxiliaries. Because nobody going to know. Well, pinch yourself for a moment. And say on March 7th, 2021, the Lord Jesus is making you aware that he knows your stronghold. And your stronghold is that you have not forgiven yourself. You have not forgiven yourself. So what? You married the wrong person after you know you wasn't supposed to. And you had to go through a lot of mess. And if you were fortunate enough, maybe God allows you to get away from that person. I'm not talking to nobody in here. But if, in fact, you have not been blessed and you're still with that person, ask God to help you. Ask God to subdue that person, to make them lovable. Yeah. We, all, all, we have all made bad decisions in life, have we not? Some of them, my God, have ramifications that are still deal, we are still dealing with today. Amen? I told you about my one-year marriage of hell, but now God has given me a princess. But at first I had to experience a demon. <laughs> I was telling Pastor Diane earlier, I said, when I came to Greater Zion and the Lord began to use me to speak, before I became a pastor, I was associate, and pastor would have me speak, I found I was always opening my mouth and saying stuff about my past. Yeah, I was saying stuff that I thought that I didn't want to tell nobody because I had that stronghold. And I said to the pastor, I said, you know something, pastor? I'm going to zip my lip. I ain't going to say nothing 
pastor said, don't you dare do that. Because what you have to say is going to be deliverance for me. Glory be to God. So when I sat here and told you one time that I stood by the subway and when people would flick their cigarette and I didn't have no money, I picked the cigarette up and smoked it. I did it. But look what God has done. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because see, you have to understand something. The things that you did in the past that you are ashamed of, you're ashamed to say to anybody because you think they're going to think down on you. But that's not true. When you tell people what God has brought you out of, they look at you a different way. They see your God in a different way. Oh, yeah. You know that you used to curse like a sailor. You had more curse words than Webster's Dictionary. You even invented a few new ones. But now God has taken your tongue and turned it and gave us the glory. You know that. You know that you was quick to take off your earrings, take off your high heels. You walked around with a jar of Vaseline in your pocketbook. You know that. You know that you was unapproachable. You know that she was nasty, walked around with a weapon in your pocketbook or pocket. As a matter of fact, you was waiting for somebody to look at you wrong so you could deal with them. But look what God has done for you. But now you try to hide that person. And God wants to use you. But he can't use you because you have not forgiven yourself. It doesn't matter how much you drink, you're here today, and your liver are still intact. I don't care how much coke you snorted, you don't have no holes in your nose. You know you took your unemployment, your welfare check. You know that. And you didn't buy food with it. You know that. You went to the bootlegger and exchanged your welfare check for alcohol on Sunday. Let me talk to you for a minute, just for a moment, before we get to 2 Corinthians. Let me talk to you. Let me show you something that God has done that I had to confess openly. Because when you confess something openly, the devil can no longer hold you for it. I want you to hear this. When I didn't have no money, I would drink Robitussin. I have taken all the uppers, the downers, the ones in the middle, all at one time. But God. That's the testimony that I have before you. I don't tell you all. But I was ashamed of all of that stuff until God opened my mouth. Because it was a stronghold. And if I would continue to say no to God, I wouldn't be here right now. And every time I would tell my testimony, there would be somebody sitting down out there would tell me afterwards, I needed to hear that. I need to know that. So here we are in 2 Chronicles. Paul is saying, for the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. So the question is, why are you trying to fight a spiritual battle naturally? Why do you think, why do you think that the thing that you hold, you get in the stronghold, that God spiritually can't dig in it? I told you about the walls of Jericho. It took a spiritual battle to tear them down. I told you earlier that I'm coming against your stronghold right now, but not with a natural weapon. I'm not going to call your name, but I'm going to put you on blast. What you did. What you did. So stop being so uh, hypocritical about the gay lifestyle when you used to participate in it. Pray for them.
Because mm-hmm. you know goodness well, you were there. Talking to you too. But now we are so hypocritical. Because I Christian now, I don't do that. Well, you used to do it. And because God brought you out, God, that's the burden prayer that you should have. God, turn them around. The same way you turned me around, turn them around. Glory be to God. You're more than able to do it, God, because you did it for me. You're not a respected person. If you did it then, you're going to do it now. You're the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You changed not. It's deliverance I'm trying to talk to you about. You're coming against your own stronghold because you want need to be delivered. You are hindering thyself. He says, glory to God. (laughs) Casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ Jesus. Do you see the power that you have? That whatever stronghold that you have, God has given you the authority, my God, to go in there and tear down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Not only that, and then bring it into captivity. That means you ain't getting out no more. I'm putting chains on you. You're not going to hinder me no more. I'm locking you up. You have bothered me long enough. You have caused me misery long enough. But today, today is the day that I come against my stronghold. Today, today, I'm bringing every thought into captivity. Everything that's trying to bind me up, I'm bringing you to captivity now. I'm sending out a warning right now. You will not hinder me no more. You will not block my blessing no more. You will not cause me no more sleepless nights. You will cause my body not to hurt me like it's been hurting me. I'm going to confess it right now. Glory be to God. I'm going to tell Jesus I'm sorry for denying the faith. I'm going to tell Jesus, glory be to God, I'm sorry for putting you on a cross afresh and anew. Every vain imagination. Stop thinking about somebody else's husband or wife. Stop thinking about if I would have married her, it wouldn't be like this. If I would have married him, it wouldn't be like this. Pull out every vain imagination. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And what do you do with it? You bring it into captivity. Because it's not hidden from you. Just like it's not hidden from God. God is telling you today, pull down your own stronghold. You have the capability. You have the power. And you have the authority to pull it down. Or you can live with it. Like you've been living with it. And it's causing your misery. It's causing sickness to come. It's causing unrest to come. And it's a burden. Hmm. What is the knowledge of God? Jeremiah chapter 4, 14 says it quite clearly. He says, O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness. Where's your stronghold? Your heart. Guard your heart. Well, out of it comes what? The issues of life. Oh, Jerusalem, 
Wash thine heart from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. And look what he says. How long shall thine vain thoughts be loose within you? <laughs> Jeremiah 4, 14. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within you? Jeremiah is saying, how long are you going to carry this thing? How long are you going to carry it? Huh? How long? How long are you going to carry that person that is dead? How long? How long? But more importantly, okay, so you betrayed something. You hurt someone. But how long are you going to carry it? How long? How long? How long? How long? How long? It's causing you to eat like you're a glutton. You're trying to fulfill a, a, a need that only God can fulfill. But you're going to have to repent and get rid of that stronghold. Nothing that you put in your body. I don't care how many times you walk around the street. You can spend around 25 times for deliverance until you say, God, I release it. I accept your forgiveness, what you paid on Calvary. Because if you don't, my God, and I keep repeating this, you are denying the faith and you are crucifying Jesus Christ afresh. You are saying that Jesus, you said all is finished. You said forgiveness, but you didn't forgive me. I can't, I don't think you can forgive me of this. I think this is beyond your power, Jesus. This is something, Jesus, that I, I just got to live with for the rest of my life. You're still paying consequences for something that Jesus has forgiven you for. It's like you being in jail for five to ten years. After ten years, you've been pardoned, but no, I don't want to leave my cell. I'm going to stay here. I'm happy where I am. Because where I am, I get three meals a day. I get free medical care. But you're in chains. Jesus is trying to get you today, trying to let you know the door has been opened. And it's been open for over 2,000 years. But you've been carrying this thing, this stronghold, some of you 10 years, some 20 years, some, my God, 30 years. You've been carrying it for a long time. My God, you didn't want nobody to even know about it. You, you don't want to think about it, but it continues to pop back into your mind. You figure if I don't speak about it, nobody's going to know about it. If I don't speak about it, it won't bother me. But the Lord says today, you're a liar because I'm going to come against your stronghold. Because I want to bless you. But I can't bless you. Because you neglect, you refuse. David says it quite clearly, children of God. We was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. You did not come into this world baptized, you know. You didn't come into this world speaking in tongues. I know some of people might feel that way, you know. You came into this world a sinner. And the only way that you can negate being a sinner is confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We know that but also accepting what he did on Calvary. Accepting the price that he paid. Amen? When he said it was finished, it's finished. It's finished. I gave you the scriptures, Micah 7, 19, Isaiah 43, 25. Jesus said it is finished, and I'm not going to remember it anymore. So why in the world do we continue to try to remind God of what we used to do when God says, I don't remember it no more? But because you, have, you are holding yourself, you know who's the one that's bringing it back to your remembrance? Satan, the adversary, the enemy of your soul. He's the one that brings the torment. He is the one that when, glory, oh my God, that's why some of you need to stop listening to R&B music because it brings back what you did when you did it. R&B, for some of you older ones, I don't know, rhythm and blues. Or reggae from my, my Caribbeans.
Because all of a sudden you remember where you was. You remember what you was doing. You remember? Oh, yeah. You remember the drifters under the boardwalk and what you was doing under the boardwalk? Or the drifters up on the roof? Or Teddy Pendergrass in between the sheets? Yeah. Yeah. You remember. But you was in between the sheets with somebody else's wife or husband. And you didn't want nobody to know, but God said, today I'm coming against the stronghold. Today is the day where you're going to release yourself from a burden that's been burdening you down for a long time. How? How can I do it? 1 John 1, 9 and 10 says, if we confess our sins, he, meaning Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then the next verse says this, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Okay? This is how you come against your stronghold that you've been carrying. Again, you are, you will easily forgive man that has hurt you. You do that. Yes, you do. But now God is saying it's time to forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. What does Jeremiah say? Get rid of those vain thoughts that you've been carrying for a long time. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. God cannot do what he wants to do in your life if you still want to hold on to this stronghold. But today, the word of the Lord says, pulling down your stronghold. I just mentioned a few things that is in your stronghold. There are other things that have happened. Oh, yes, there is. Yes, there is. But I think I have said enough that the Holy Spirit has brought to your attention in which your stronghold is. Otherwise, God would not have sent this word. The word would not say he sends his word that he see pleases, and it will accomplish that what he sent it out to do. And this word comes today. Glory be to God. So you can clean the slate. That you can get rid of this thing that's been tormenting you for years. If we can fully embrace the grace of God, when we believe that all our sins have been washed away, do you believe that? Do you believe that all your sins have been washed away? Or do you believe that only some of them? Are you willing, children of God, and those that will be doing later on, are you willing just to open up to God and say, God, I'm tearing down my stronghold. Brick by brick, I'm tearing it down. Everything that I neglected, my God, to say. And you don't have to tell people. But you got to tell God. He already knows about it. This thing that is holding you should not be holding you. It should not. Guess who's holding you? You. Yourself. Don't blame the devil. It's you. You are holding back your own blessings. Your own blessings. It's like me telling you, I got a million dollars for you. All you got to do is come to me and open the door. And you sit there, oh, I don't deserve a million dollars. I don't deserve that blessing because you, you, you don't know me. You know, I, I'm just no good. I'll take it and just flounder it. I'm just there. But yet you are confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So if he's telling you to come, that means he got something for you. But the problem is, the closer we get to the door, the more we remember what we hold him back. And we refuse to go to the door. Because we begin 
to remember. That's right. And he has tried to open the door. And you right there on the doorstep, right on the doorstep. And then you allow some clowns to come to dissuade you away from going through the door. It's right there for you, right on the other side. As a matter of fact, just to show you how much he wants to bless you, he blessed you on the top step of the door before you got on the other side. He already blessed you there, but the greater one is behind that closed door. And this is where your struggle is at right now. You're struggling. You're struggling. But I declare in the name of Jesus, if you would just go through. Do what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. Because he has already told you. Already told you. Don't allow fear to overtake you. Don't allow your background, because they tell you what you used to be, you know. You know you received, you were serving that heathen God before. Yeah, I know it's right. Because the Holy Spirit knows it's right. But the God that you serve now is greater than that heathen God. The God you serve now took you out of that mess. Now God say, go through the door. Run through a troop? Yes. But the greater blessing is when you leap over the wall. My God. That help you, brother? I know it did. Stronghold. Stronghold. Strongholds. Strongholds. Now the Lord has sent his word today. And I'm quite sure it was just not what for one. <laughs> I know it wasn't just for one. I know that. Because the Lord wants us to be free. He wants us to be able to enjoy him without any hindrances. He wants us to be able to function in the kingdom with a clean spirit. What did David say in 32 verses 2 and 3? A man with no guile. Blessed is a man whose sins are forgiven. Right? Ezra 9, 13, glory says. My, one of my favorite scriptures, Ezra 9, 13. He says, after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespasses, and seeing that thou, our God, <laughs> has given us such deliverance as this, in other words, he was saying, after all my nastiness, you saved me, you cleansed me, you raised me up, glory be to God, now you want to use me? Such deliverance as this. And I'm going to let this little thing that I did in the past block me? The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. I'm going forward. All motives running. No hindrances. Nothing is going to block me. I've made up in my mind. <laughs> Jesus Christ is my Lord, and I'm going to run with him until he calls me home. I'm not going to allow no hindrance. Nothing that's going to come from my past, my God, to influence my walk. My God, I'll be like Paul. I count everything in the past as dung. I shot that shake it. Hmm. Oh, I feel you. Mm -hmm. Some of you in here right now are ready. You ready right now to release it, aren't you? I know you are. Because God has brought it to your attention. Mm -hmm. You see, because you tell certain of your friends what you used to do because they was there when you did it. But you neglected to tell God that you're sorry for it. Has God ever brought something back to you from your past and it made you shiver? Huh? That when he brought it back, he let you know, even though they was pointing that gun at you, boy, and I made it click and it didn't fire, that because I was saving you? Yeah, yeah. I was in a welfare hotel. 
Yeah, Manhattan. They got kicked out of my house. Went to the welfare hotel. Me and my cousin, Tyrone. <clears throat> and we had a thing at night. Because, you know, the welfare doors, they ain't locked too tight. When you sleep at night, you had to put your bed against the door. But some of the people, the newer ones, they didn't know that. And we'd bust into the room. Made the mistake and bust into the wrong room. He had a pistol pointed right at my head. Click, click, click. I said, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Only God. Because there's a purpose. God brought you through for a reason. That's why you need to let loose of the stronghold. Don't be ashamed of what you did. Well, I could tell you a whole lot of stuff, but no, it's none of your business anymore. Only as the Holy Spirit tells me to say. But you needed to hear that. You needed to hear that. Stand to your feet, please. I know this message didn't make you dance around. This is not one of these kind of messages. This is the kind of message God is sending to your heart by his Holy Spirit. And while the word was going forth, he was bringing back to your remembrance your strongholds. Now is the time to release your stronghold. Stop denying the faith. Stop putting Jesus on the cross afresh. Understand that his forgiveness applies not only when you forgive someone else, but when you forgive yourself also. Forgive yourself also. Just need. Now, this is a point of confession because the word tells me quite clearly in the book of Matthew. If you deny my Jesus, he will deny you before the Father. Amen? Now, those of you in here right now, you don't have to tell nobody what it was, but this word hit you, raise up your hands, your hands in the air. Just raise up your hands. And as your hands are raising up, this is a point of confession. You're now saying to God, God, I'm the one. But now, God, I release my stronghold. I receive your forgiveness of my sins. Now, God, I ask you to cleanse me afresh and anew. I thank you for restoration. I thank you that I now can receive the blessings that you have for me without any hindrance, without any blockage. I thank you that in my spirit there is no guile, no open doors, because I'm confessing it to you now in Jesus' name. Now, if you believe that, give God the best praise you can give him.